Inshallah, the Q&A will start in the next 10 minutes. You, you can enjoy a cup of tea or some snacks. And then 9.30, we shall start the Q&A, Inshallah. 9.30. So please stay back for the Q&A. And also, a quick announcement for tomorrow's event. There is a majlis organized by the 14 stars uh, at uh, Idara Jafriya tomorrow at 7.30. 9.30. After, after Maghrib. After Maghrib, there will be a majlis at Idari Jafri, organized by the 14 Sars. Uh, the majlis will be recited by Maulana Wasil Hassan Khan Saab. Inshallah, you are all requested to please attend the majlis one time. And the Q&A will start in next 10 minutes, say by 9.30, Inshallah.
my humble request to all the brothers who are still enjoying the dinner please finish in we have got only 2 minutes to start sheikh is in rush in a rush he's he need to go back you, you please appreciate that he has go back to shepherd bush he would like to start at 9:30 sharp so i humbly request you all to kindly wind up your uh, dinner in next couple of minutes thank you Testing, testing. Hello, hello. Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters. Uh, we are about to start the Q&A session. Can you please uh, all have the focus here, please? May I request Sheikh to please come on the member. Um, the way it's going to work tonight is that, first of all, I'd like to thank the Sheikh again for giving us the opportunity to have a Q&A session for the second time, alhamdulillah. And uh, Sheikh Hassan will briefly talk about uh, the issues or the topics about why Q&A is important and a five-minute uh, quick lecture. After that, we'll start taking questions. Thank you. Yeah, uh, anybody has questions, they can text it on the number which is displayed on the screen or on YouTube channel. Or if you want to ask here, you can ask here. Obviously, anybody asking questions here directly can be asked. As well as the sisters as well.
Apparently, yeah, let me. Okay, I'll be lahm in a shaitan or a jim, bismillah, rahman, rahim. As you all know, the topic of the lectures was reconnecting with God in the modern age. So, preferably speaking, I hope that we can stick to the topics that were discussed for the questions, at least to give priority to those. And I just wanted to mention one thing. I think it's very important when we are asking questions to bear one thing in mind, and that is our own personal experience and our own personal journeys. Like, I think we should care the least about what the other person thinks and how they feel and how we can help them connect to God and how I can make X, Y, and Z understand God, because that's not my responsibility. My initial responsibility is to connect with God myself and be able to develop that. People complain about why is this person not listening, why is that person not listening. Perhaps sometimes maybe the reason is that you haven't focused on yourself enough to be able to develop your character, your personality in a way that when the other person looks at you, just by your conduct and your action, they would want to become like you. And you don't need to preach anymore. There was a person who went to, there was a group of people who went to Ayatollah Bahjat when they finished their studies in Qom. And if I remember correctly, they were from uh, from Azerbaijan, if I remember correctly. And they were like, we're going to go back. What should we do exactly? You know, how, can, how and what kind of preaching should we engage in? And he was like, look, there's one thing very important, bear in mind. And that is, when you go back, just go and live among people. Okay? And what you have learned and what the habits you've developed and the characteristics you've basic and the personality you have created, that in and of itself would be a form of tabligh of yours. So you first start doing tabligh using your actions and who you are, then from what you're saying to people. So I think when we're say, when sitting here, our initial focus and uh, the questions should be directed at something that's really personal for you, you really want to know, and it's going to contribute towards my growth and every single one of your growth, inshallah. And as much as I can, I will be able to respond to that and that is the key point when we take the first steps and ask questions about the details of it and hopefully the clarification then will help us to make the first step make the move inshallah towards Allah and that is what we're hoping to so I'm open to any questions related to my uh, lecture and I'll try my best as much as my knowledge which is very limited to the degree and capacity I have inshallah I'll try to respond I think you are the moderator here so please Help me. I'm not going to know who t who starts first, but if you can do that for me, please. Thank you. Thank you. Want me to ask a question? Okay. My question is nothing to do with uh, what you said now. Just wanted to know your background, where you come from, and what sort of uh, uh, education and everything you got, and then we carry on from there. Let's be. I my guess is you're from Iran, but again, the rest is <laughs> you to explain. That's a very good question. Because people, because everybody asking me, even I, I said he is not Urdu. But he said he's from, from Africa. I said no. no. So I'm not Urdu. I know Urdu. Kiale, Tike. Your knowledge is very good. Your knowledge is very good. Brother, your knowledge is very good. That's oh, why people want to know. Thank you. No, thank you very much. It's very nice of you. So, um, yes, I'm unfortunately not Urdu speaking. I pretend sometimes, but I can't get away with it. Um, so, I am originally from Iran, that's right. I do have a little bit of background from Iraq and Iran. My family, they, my grandparents used to live in Iraq as well. And, um, yep, I completed my, well, we can't say complete, but I had an experience of education in the Hausa in Qom. And I returned in 2017, and I did university here as well, my master's degree here. I live here at the moment and I teach at the Hausa in London, which is in Northwest in Wilsdon Green. It's the building right next to the Islamic College. Your son is there? Uh, yeah, he's doing there. He has What's his name? Muhammad Muntazir. Muhammad Muntazir. Not sure. If yes. Yes, so that's where, that's where I teach and usually that's where you can find me, basically. Yeah, Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much. Uh, it's very enlightening lectures. 
Uh, I didn't follow all the points, but I, the bits I followed was very interesting. You mentioned one point yesterday, which uh, I thought was quite interesting, the point about uh, Prophet Dawood or David being infallible. Um, but it, according to the Torah itself, they find faults in him and treated him as not infallible. And I'm referring to the episode where he spots the... The lady. The lady, yeah, et cetera. I don't yeah. want to go into details. Um, and I, I just want to know the concept of infallibility. And why yeah. uh, it seems to be very uh, important to the, our philosophy, but less so with other philosophies. Yeah. Just on that point, I was going to mention it in my lecture, but when I brought the story up the first time, I wasn't able to go in a bit deeper into the biblical version of it. And in that version, yeah, you know the, the whole song, the Hallelujah, that's also based on that. Um, you saw her bathing on the roof um, and, and so on, basically. Her beauty and her something overthrew ya, something like that. So it talks about David and when he saw the lady and he fell in love with her, so therefore he sent the husband to the battlefield. The front line made sure that he told his general to send this guy to the front line so make sure he dies so that he can get married to the woman. Or even in, in another version they said that no, he actually had zina with the woman and then he sent the husband. So basically that's the version, you're right. And they don't even think he's a, he's a prophet and they call him King David. Nevertheless, um, infallibility in and of itself, when we look at our narrations, this, this story, from the biblical story, has been presented to, I think, two of our imams, if I remember. One imam, and I'm not, I don't remember the other imam. And, and in a gathering where the imams were, they asked, okay, what's the story of David? They say, well, the biblical stories, they say this and that about. And he was like, Allah, this is a prophet of God. He wouldn't do that. Now, one thing we try to explain in these lectures, implicitly, I didn't really get into the theological discussion, and that is that there is something called infallibility, which is, committing sins knowingly and intentionally okay that our prophets all were infallible they didn't do knowingly and intentionally they were they were protected from that now that doesn't mean that they don't make mistakes that doesn't that doesn't mean they don't have growth in their life so that aspect i tried to highlight in a number of stories i mentioned in these lectures is that how in the, their journey through their mistakes even god taught them a lesson about creation, about himself, about tawakkul, etc. So, infallibility, there's an importance, um, there's, there's an emphasis on it, but the definition of it is not very like, you know, this person's a perfect thing, he makes no mistakes, has no limited perceptions, that's not true. He's got the minimum in order to be a prophet. Now, in theology, there's lots of discussions on what infallibility really entails. Does it, does it mean they know the concepts? Does it mean they know the application of it as well? Meaning, I know, for example, that lying is haram. But does that mean that I know exactly, in every moment of my life, I'm conscious enough to know what I'm saying, is it a lie or not? Maybe I say something, and in reality, it was not true, but I didn't know. So there's lots of discussions on that. What, what's the scope of infallibility? But the gist of it, I think, is important, is that they wouldn't knowingly and intentionally right, go against God's will. While they know that this is God's will, and they also, they, they're, they're free to choose between them, but they won't. That's like a very simple, I think, approach. Does that make sense? But the theolo theological discussion is much deeper, and it, I don't think this is... No, it does make sense, but I mean, if you compare it to Jacob, for example, who, who, uh, whose prophethood God. was removed because he didn't get off, his, get off the chair, the throne... And you compare it to David's story, both in the Old Testament. Yeah, so I just don't understand yeah. the, the, the difference. The difference between what? Sorry. Between David and Jacob, where Jacob was removed from prophethood because he didn't get up for his father, whereas David... Uh, yeah, did this, and the result of it was a form of punishment, but it's just that his son dies. And God says in, in the Old Testament, he said that, Okay, we'll forgive you, and that's fine, and you know everything's good. But be for people then to accept that you know you've made a mistake, etc., that you need to pay a price, and therefore he took away his son from him. That's the the well, Old Testament or New Testament, I'm not sure, but that's the biblical version of it. Um, 
So I don't know. I'm not a, an expert in that. So I wouldn't know exactly why that's the case. But it, if you're talking about inconsistency, I think that's the least we can say that definitely is inconsistent. Okay. I have a little question regarding this. Sorry about that. We have to believe the, what Quran has said. What another narration like he is asking or you have said, it is different completely. We shouldn't believe them, not at all. We should believe what Quran has said, Dawud al-Islam, and even prophet, even prophet not doing tark Allah. So we mm -hmm. should follow Quran. Forget everybody said, Christianity said, what. that's what my... my it's good to do comparative studies, but yeah, it's important yeah. to know that which one are we, are we eventually we accepting we listen them, as well. Definitely, definitely, we shouldn't believe them. At the brother over there, do you want to add a point to this question? or? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, that's, that's the furthest it goes. Thank you very much for the thank talks. You. And I'd like to thank everybody that was involved in this whole Muharram program. Uh, I benefited and so did my son. It's like his first Muharram for him properly. And I've seen a transformation, and I'm grateful to Allah and for all the efforts of the brothers and sisters. Um, I, I wanted to add something because uh, there's been times when I've sat with some of my ulama friends, and uh, none of them, their first language is English. Um, and the topic of the word infallible, you know, there was, we was having some issues with that word in English because. We know there is no comparison to Allah, Laysa Kamithlihi Shay, and and Allah is definitely, you know, infallible. So, um, a dear brother, uh, brother Lukman, his Arabic is very strong. His English is first language, and what he said was the word that seems to fit better and can be less inflammatory and less of a trigger for Sunnis mm. and others is the word impeccable. Mm. They have the ability as a human, because you know they're basher, you know, they have the ability to they are un, they're subjected to the laws of nature. Yeah. But one of the things of many of the gifts of Allah with them is their actual connection to Allah. Their actual witnessing the divine presence as much as a human can. And therefore, if you're living in this kind of level of yaqeen, doing something wrong is so below you, and your behavior and your station, your hal is so high, this is not even a consideration. And in that, with that word impeccable, it kind of gives them even more standing. Mm. Because it's, just, it's not like they're prevented from sinning. It's like sin was something that they wouldn't do. Not just couldn't, they wouldn't. Yeah, they wouldn't. Yeah, that's a good point. And uh, that was something, this word impeccable, I hope that people start to consider it and see how it lies and how it fits in an English translation. Yeah. And uh, the last thing I want to end, uh, I'm from a Christian background. I grew up in a church. I love my Bible. Yeah. <laughs> Big time growing up. And the story of David, Dawood, alayhi uh, salam, I believe the, the woman that he wanted, it might be Beth, Beth, she, Beth Sheba, I think her name might be, but what's really bad mm. is that after he got her husband killed and then he does what he does with her, she's supposed to be, I believe, the mother of Suleiman mm, Yeah. So this is obviously she became pregnant, ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, this story in the Bible even what we know of the station of the MBR. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your input. Thank you. Thank you, brother, for your input. Um, can I request? Oh, you got a question? Yeah. Just on next after this. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum, Maulana. Thank you so much for your exceptional speeches. We learn substantial knowledge from it. Thank you. And really, once again, thank you so much from everyone. I've got one question with refer to the majlis you recited either on 7th or 8th of Muharram. You mentioned that Hazrat Ibrahim uh, saw the stars and uh, when the star disappeared, 
he said, no, this can't be my God. Then he saw the moon, it's exactly the same thing happens. And then he saw yeah. the sun, same thing happens. But according to our Shia belief, we believe that all prophethood born with their prophet. They are not that they become prophet after a certain time. Like Alice would not believe that after 40 years, our own prophet, Prophet Muhammad, become prophet. But we believe very strongly with the, that a prophet was prophet from the day first he born. So this made me a little bit confused, thinking, um, is that Hazrat Ibrahim was not prophet when he born? He was given prophet after a certain time because he, he doesn't know who his God is. And he's seeing um, stars and moons and sun saying that when they disappear, this is not my God. So can you please clarify this uh, like to, to improve my knowledge uh, and, and, and get, get the correct information uh, yes. in my brain? Sure. So the first point is the prophets are not born prophets. So they become prophets. In the narration it says Ibrahim became a Nabi before he became a Rasul. He became a Rasul before he became a Khalil. He became a Khalil before he became an Imam. So there's, there's levels of, of Anbiya and they, they don't, they're not born a Nabi. There's a discussion as to whether prior to Nobowa, prior to receiving divine revelation, and you know there's lots of discussions and differences of opinion as to what does it mean for it to be a Nabi. What's the difference between a Nabi and a Rasul, right? There's overlap sometimes, there's discussions in theology, but what's important to note is that they were not born a Nabi. They were born to be a Nabi, that's different, but they were not born as a Nabi. Nubuwa, because they're now bound to time, happened at a specific time in their life. For our Prophet, happened when he was 40. But now there's a discussion as to prior to that, did he know he will be a Prophet or not? Did, was he protected from sins and mistakes the same way he was protected after Nubuwa or not? Those discussions exist, but the key point is that he was not a Nabi before that. That's for sure. So something happened that changed. When he received revelation, there was a first time of revelation. He never had it before that, right? So that's one thing to note. The other thing is about Ibrahim. I mentioned in the next year, I said, um, based on our theological background and premises, we don't agree that Ibrahim actually went on this journey of discovering the God, well, discovering God, basically, and which gods he would basically renounce. But... The Qur'an talks as if he went through that. That's the language of the Qur'an. So we said because we know that he didn't really, and the Qur'an talks as if he did, now the question is why is there a difference between the two? Some of the scholars have said it's in order for people to learn. So he did that for people then to, oh yeah, you're right actually, this disappears. How did we, so he pretended, okay? Now there are explanations there. What the lesson I wanted to use from this is that no matter what, ha what is happening in reality, God says the story in a way that Ibrahim had the experience. Okay, So it shows to us perhaps that experience is necessary. To see things and feel things is necessary. And in order to give us then the guidelines as to now that I'm going out there, I want to see. Okay, I want to see what exists in this world. These people believe that, I don't know, there are inter things, there are beings which are independent and they control the universe. This is the God of, I don't know, that brings rain. This is the one who controls the wind. Okay, I want to go and see what that is. So from this story, we got a couple of lessons that were very crucial for someone who wants to go on a journey of discovery, we said. Because God speaks as if it's Ibrahim went through the journey and then he puts the conditions there. If you're going through the journey of discovery, number one, remember that always know that there's something about the heart. It's not just logic, okay? Listen to the heart. But in order to listen to the heart, you need to have a good interpretation system. Interpreting system. Sometimes the heart says something, maybe it's a whisper of the shaitan. So therefore, as a second condition, definitely ask Allah for guidance constantly and repetitively. If my Lord doesn't guide me. So 
I'll go, but if my Lord doesn't guide me, I know that my feelings could take me to the very wrong direction. That was the point there. Okay, thank you, Heather. Before I ask uh, some brothers for questions, are there any questions from the sisters, please? Let's have a question from the sisters. So one of the sister, Sister Fatima Bandali, she wants to know, she says, Salam, regarding guidance and free will, shaitan is an open enemy who will misguide us until the appointed day. How do we combat the pull push towards God when shaitan alludes against God-centric actions if we were to only rely on our own to be guided? That's a very difficult question. That's the answer. <laughs> so how do we combat shaitan while relying on God? I don't know. <laughs> Inshallah, next ashra, yeah, as I said, I'll, I'll research this. But there's one thing. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll put that alongside another question that was asked on my Instagram uh, page to be mentioned tonight and, um, and another sister she asked she said uh, should we ask for shaitan to be to, to for Allah to, to bring him closer to hidayah something like that right which in a way I think it's important to understand the system of God again here that God has created shaitan and I know for us shaitan is like you know this this devil this beast whatever it is but he's a very key me he's a very key player in this world and if shaitan didn't exist then none of our actions would have had any value because shaitan is the temptation what we talked about today it's that he gives you an alternative option for then for your decision to choose the right path to make sense and have any value he's the one who pushes you who pulls you towards the wrong he needs to do that okay now what's between him and God this is quite complicated but he needs to do that and the whole system depends on him so you better not ask Allah to guide him in a way maybe I'm joking about this but because his his, his role is necessary the, the pull that he has it's with that pull that then you not listening to him as a value right so in I don't know what shaitan is and I don't know how I can necessarily pinpoint and say this is where shaitan is trying to tell me go do this or do that. It's a, it's a complicated thing. Um, but, but there's one thing that what we've talked about here is everything that's getting you closer to God is taking you away from shaitan. I think that's a very, very simple thing. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I've got Rizwan first, then we've got Ali and we've got here. We've got three questions in a row. Assalamu alaikum, Aga. MashaAllah, very enlightening lectures you know, we have had here. Thank you. And uh, thank you so much for um, all your contribution. Uh, I've got a simple, very small question. You know, getting closer or reconnecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, does that only, um, you, are, you are referring to Muslims or, you know, even any human beings because we, we all are creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, um, what my question is, you know, even if, if somebody who's not Muslim, but he has got that power that sometimes he, when he's alone or he's, he's trying to think and he's trying to get connected with Allah. Yeah. So does that happen, do you think, in your research? I mean, you know, because yeah. I remember a story, you know, uh, Prophet Musa used to go and talk, you know, in Kohetur. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked him one day that, Musa, did you bring anything for me? So Hazrat Musa said that, you know, what can I bring? Everything is yours. He said, no, I mean, did you get me anything? Did you, did you, have you got anything to offer me? He said, my whole life yeah. is in front of you. I yeah. do the prayers. He said that the prayers is only because it's my order. Yeah. Have you done anything for me? Yeah. Then Musa didn't have the answer. Yeah. Then Allah asked him that, have you ever made a friend because of me? Or have you ever made an enemy because of me? That means whatever we do in our life should be only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. So 
my question to you is you know if if a person is non muslim but he is pious he's he's not hurting anyone you know maybe he's connected sometimes with allah subhanahu wa taala you know so do you have you read anything like that that they do get connected yeah thank you for that question i think um, it's so interesting that you say this because i think the entire focus of my lectures was to say that just saying we are Muslims is not enough. It's the first step, submitting yourself to God, but then we have to go through Iman, as we said, then we have to get to Yaqeen and all of that. And that journey is equal in other religions as well. Islam talks very interestingly about other religions. It talks about the negative aspects of their religion, but also talks about the positive ones. That's, for example, the Jews, who the Quran condemns them a lot in some areas, but also keeps the balance. In a, in a, in a verse, it talks very beautifully about them. It says, it talks negatively about them. It says, oh, these are, this is what they've done, etc. And then immediately says, Laysu sawa'a. They're not the same. Min ahl al kitabi ummatun. Min ahl al kitabi ummatun. Qa'imatun yatluna ayatillahi ana al layl wa hum yasjudun. From the ahl al kitab, there are also people who get up at night, they recite the verses, they connect with, the, with their Lord. And they have all these things, they, they do have belief. Of course they do connect. In another verse it says, Those people who brought Iman, those people who are Jew, the Christians, the, Sab the Sabians, that's the criteria, says, look, if they have faith in God, and believe that there is something beyond this world, they're not just limited to matter, they're not going to disappear and that's the end. And they do good. And it doesn't say God will, you know, somehow forgive their sins. It says God will reward them for what they have done. That means their actions, there's a value to their actions, they can connect to God as well. Now, what's the importance of Islam then? If you look at it this way, there are many ways of get connecting with God. But we believe if someone is a true Muslim and really looks into the teachings of Islam, they will find that the path of Islam is a faster one, is a more clearer one. It, does, it has less of the distortions, right? Less... Um, confusion perhaps there's this confusion in Islam as well there's so many different sects everyone's saying their own thing but it has less of that and the path is clearer okay with the teachings etc that's the claim otherwise people connect with God sometimes non-muslims connect with God better than a lot of our Muslims right God doesn't just dis discriminate like that it's us these, these are our boundaries that we put it's with the tr trueness in the heart. The person who believes in God is a Muslim, right? The Islam, the Aqaidi Islam is different to the Fiqhi Islam. Let me just mention this last point. The Fiqhi Islam is the one which by them saying, I am a Muslim, you treat them as a Muslim from a Fiqhi legal point of view, meaning that you bury them in a Muslim graveyard, you allow them to marry you know, into a Muslim family, etc. What does that require? That requires you saying it by tongue. Even if you don't have it in your heart. You say it by tongue, you submit, that's it. From a fiqh point of view, all the ahkam of Muslim applies to you. But from an aqaidi point of view, who's a Muslim? Not necessarily, this person is not considered Muslim in that regard. There's, there's details to it, there's, there's, there's complexities there. There's discussion on iman there, how much of it is true for you. That aqaidi one is the one which on the day of judgment will go to heaven, right? There's, there's some details to it, to say the least. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Wa alaikum as uh, My question is regarding the hadith you mentioned about the hearts and how when it is open you feed it and when it is closed you starve it. How about like when we are told to do things, for example, for 40 days, like du'a had for 40 days or practice this for a certain period of time? Yeah. And maybe along that time, day 25 or 6, for example, you don't feel like doing it. How do you then, you want to complete the 40 days for your goal, 
but you feel that maybe your heart is also not feeling it. So then in that situation, how do you manage that? When it comes to examples, I think it, it really depends on the person, right? So I know if I, if I push myself a bit more, then I'm, trying to, I'm training my muscle, but, I, but someone else says if I push myself a bit more, I've reached the limit now. I know I'm going to start hating it. It's not a wajib thing. Don't do it. You know? So you have to know exactly what's happening inside you. It requires a bit of an awareness, right? There are people who, they were forced by their families to start doing, say, recitation of the Qur'an, memorization of the Qur'an. And you see that this person initially they're connected with it, but, it, but eventually they memorize the Qur'an. But you see that for a few years, I know, that, I know individuals, for a few years they didn't touch the Qur'an after that. Because they were put off. It's just the heart is pushing, you know, it, it was forced. And it's gone blind now. It cannot see the importance of it anymore. So you have to undo the damage now. So it's, it's upon, I think it depends on the person. You can justify, because you don't want to just be comfortable just sitting at home. Okay, whatever is comfortable, I'll do. No, you want to eventually get to a point where even some mustahabbat, you start doing them regularly. It's, but you have to just bear this principle in mind. You don't force too much, right? But you don't just let go of yourself. That's not the case. So the same thing we said with wajibat versus mustahabbat. Someone who grows a bit higher in that, it would become some mustahabbat versus some other mustahabbat. Does that make sense? So it's gradual. It's gradual growth. Sometimes, this is, this is a line very famous among scholars. They say, Hasanatul abrar sayyatul muqarrabin. There are different groups of people. There's abrar and there's muqarrabin, those who are close to God. The good deeds of the abrar will be considered as bad deeds for the muqarrabin. There's different criteria. These people, because they're in this level, when we go beyond wajib and haram, wajib and haram is the, is the basic, is the base. You go higher, it depends. You need to be very aware of yourself, what you're doing, how much you're doing, is it too much, not. Sometimes the good of this person will be bad for this. You, no, you don't engage in that because your level is higher now. You refrain from this. Or no, you have to go and do something else. If this person sleeps at night, and doesn't wake up for Salatul Layl, it's fine for him. Yeah? It's not, it's not a big deal. Because he's working on other things. But for you, no. Not only it's basically mustahab, but it becomes wajib. You're the prophet, get up at night. You need it. For your level, you have to do it. You know? There's different levels people go up. Thank you. Can I quickly to ask a question? Yeah, my, my question is, uh, is connected to what Ali asked uh, uh, about the different phases in a person's life. Uh, you know, you said that if you're, uh, when you, you don't find yourself uh, spiritually uh, connected, then you just concentrate on the wajibat and then leave all the mustahabat. Then um, I have noticed that, you know, even when, we, when I just try to do the wajibat, then um, as, because of so many distractions, then even the wajibat, uh, they get delayed till the, till the end. And it's almost at the last time, for, for example, salat. Uh, it's almost when the salat is getting qaza, then just perform the salah and then it's, it's all done. So is there a way in which we can train up? You know, if, if, I, if I leave this for long, then I don't know, you know, whether I'm going to come back on the right track or not. So is there any way in which I can yeah. train my heart? Uh... One thing I'm definitely not, I struggle to know exactly what I am and what I'm not, right? But there's few things I know definitely I'm not. And that's a spiritual guide. I know for sure I'm not that. So I wouldn't know. I can't give anyone any individual advice at all. Um, I need to get advice myself, myself. So, I don't know exactly. But there are, you know, there are things to encourage oneself. You really need to sit down and see what is it that encourages you to do that. <coughs> There's narrations that talk about the benefit of praying, let's say, on time. On, so, the mind, there's a, there's a narration which is beautiful. It says, مَا ضَعُفَ from Amir Mu'min 
ما ضعف بدن ما قويت عليه النية Nobody is weak for an intention that is strong When you know you have to do this and you want to do it No body, right, physical body will stay behind The person who has a purpose and knows that they want to do something So whatever it is often needs to, be, needs to happen in here, right? So, if, I, if I'm not doing that, it's perhaps because I don't know the benefit of it. It's because I don't, you know, it doesn't seem to, I don't seem to see it. So one thing maybe we can pray for is that, oh Allah, I, I can't do this, I don't feel like it. But show me, show me the benefit of it. Show me something that will encourage me to do it. You, that would become your prayer. But if you make it your prayer, and if you put it in your mind every day, remember that this is what I want. There's a guarantee that you will get it because that, that, that will then become your focus. The worst thing is for you to let go of it and say, this is happening, that's it. That, that's something we shouldn't do. But the fact that you're, it's happening there, just acknowledge it and ask Allah to bring, it, bring you out of it. No matter how long it takes, but that should be the constant ask from Allah to help us you know, improve in it. Inshallah, it will happen. Yourself. <laughs> Young in heart. Young in heart. Yes. Um, I have a question from my wife. Uh, actually, she sent me four questions, but I'll just wow. start with one. Um, she's asking if you think there is a relationship between the the poor spiritual state of humans as a as a whole, and um, does that sort of collectively result in the poor state of the world, such as you know the corruption and the violence and um, uh, as such, so you, you know, the, does the um, the collective human condition manifest itself externally? I think I I think so. Yeah, there is there's definitely a, a relationship between that, and even like in reality, our narrations talk about how the existence of one individual who's a full spiritual master on earth is necessary for the earth not to swallow itself right that's how much one individual who's a master in spirituality is necessary for them to exist in, in earth for it not to for the for it to become complete chaos so you can probably take it from there right and say yes spiritual people impact that they have not just normal impact on other people maybe even existential impact one may can one maybe can argue Right? So, but definitely from a spiritual point of view, of course, if there's more spiritual people, then they won't, then there'll be less people engaged in actions which are wrong. So I think that's, yes, yeah, stating the obvious from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I've got a question from Sister Noor here. Even your mic is not working. Yeah, I don't know. Don't. Yeah. Yeah, Sister Nur is asking, uh, you mentioned Mullah Sadr, which book is good to start reading on his philosophy? You know what's very interesting about the story, the most interesting, sorry about this question, the in most interesting part, is that I can't think, remember I mentioned Mullah Sadr in any of my lectures, wow. whatsoever. So, I thought, of because I had the question before this, I thought, Lord, I even spoke to one of my friends. I said, I don't think I mentioned Mullah Sadra at all. So if, does anyone remember any, any, any no, so, so I, I don't think I, I have. So I think the question would be, yeah, it's possible. It's possible. Yeah. No, I don't know that story probably. I, I can't remember of it. Yeah, no. I don't think I have mentioned his name. I can vouch for that because I was sitting for yeah, all of my dances. You, 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 yeah. you never heard a word of Mullah. Yeah. I did mention Allah Mataba Tabai. And, and, and Ahab Hajjad, you mentioned a couple of times. I mentioned, yeah, I, I mentioned a number of them, but I don't think Mullah So uh, this, and I don't know if it's, this question is from one of the sister or a brother, but it's come online. It says, Salam, my only language is English, and sometimes during prayer, 
I feel like there is no connection to what I am saying. How can I feel the words more in my heart during prayer? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Can I answer this? Please go ahead. My practical we also have a learned sheikh here. I feel so bad every time I'm <laughs> no, answering. Um, we can benefit from being, his input being a layman, as well. Being a layman, um, uh, Maulana Sabir Hussain comes from Lucknow to my place to recite majlis. And in Ramzan he said, when you recite prayers, do you understand your Fatiha and Kul? And I said, but just read it. What's just going on? Yeah. He in 10 days explained it. And now if I don't finish the Alhamd, I have to come back again. To understand what I said. Yeah. So uh, I think if you ponder on it or get some advice from Sheikhs, um, I, he said if you don't understand, go by ten times read it because you need to understand what you're saying. Yeah. So we just go by and sometimes I think, oh, what did it say? Ar Rahman Ar Rahim Maliki Mujhe. No, go back, finish it and start again. So, um, so it's a simple question. I'm saying, I when I pray now, I have to concentrate on what I'm saying. Yeah. Like you can add on if you want to. Oh, would you? You want to add something, Sheikh? No. I've got a question here from. I think it's something that most of us are experiencing, right? We have to be honest with it. Like this prayer, sometimes meditating makes more sense because you know you know what you're saying, you know what you're thinking about, and you know exactly what's happening. But one thing I think that's a huge injustice to Salat is that we do it out of a ritual, ritual in a ma and, and that really takes away the importance of the words that we're saying and what are we saying. If you just think of Surah Al-Hamd as Allah said here, it's about connecting, the, you start with connecting with the meaning, but the meaning is okay, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ We only ask you, we only worship you and we only ask you for What does that actually mean? There's so much deeper explanation on what this iya kana abudu wa iya kana sta'in mean. But, you know, because we haven't studied it, so we just say it and that's it. Of course, it, you know, it won't have the spiritual impact that we're looking for. That, yes, it's a routine. It's good. It has, it has inshallah, you know, on the day of judgment, it's going to help you. But in this world, how much is it going to, you know, really elevate our souls? It wouldn't if we don't know exactly what we're saying. If it wouldn't if we don't know. You know, I, I just mentioned one small point here. I said, look, we talk about gratitude so much. And people say, wake up in the morning every day, you know, 10 minutes mindfulness and remember the blessings that Allah has given you. Well, Allah, they say God, yeah, or universe. They say, remember the, the, ben the, the good things the universe has given you so that you attract all the good back to you in your life. And I'm like, yeah, that's so beautiful. But you know what else is beautiful? Is that our religion 1400 years ago told us to wake up in the morning before sunrise and to read two rak'ah salat, two rak'ah in which how many times we use the word hamd? Right? If for every single moment in salat that you use the word hamd, you just think of hamd, right? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Sami'allahu liman hamidah. Sami'a means here. God hears the one who does hamd and praises and thanks him for things, right? And the scholars have said when, when we say God hears, that's stating the obvious. Sami'a means sami'a was tajaba, means he hears and he responds. And God hearing mean God, means God responding. And if you do hamd and shukr of him, you will see the impact in your life firsthand, tangible. So if you just connect to the hamd words of salat every day that you're doing, that will make you a much more grateful person in your life. That's just the word hamd and let alone all the other parts which is pure tawheed. But for that we require a lot more discussions and probably my teachers have to come and explain this because who am I to say these things? As Sheikh Jawad, my friend, usually says, I'm a potato about himself. <laughs> well, that's an underestimation when I think of it. You know, I'm like, um, what is this? But you know, it's good sometimes to say that I'm a nobody, really. And the teachers have to come and explain this and say, what, what does that really mean? It's, it's amazing. I've heard some of them explain it and it's mind-blowing. So there's definitely deeper ways of connecting with Salat.
10 more minutes? 10 minutes, we'll finish it. Um, I've got one question, if I may be allowed to ask one question quickly. Thank you. Why is it going so much? Uh, there's a very famous ayat in the Quran which talks about that Salah prevents you from committing sins. But the greater ibadah is, is zikrullah. Mm, yes. And so you're talking of connecting to God. And then how do we connect that connection God with zikr? And what is the best form of zikr? How do we one practice zikr? What are the techniques for zikr? And how do you, if that is the greater ibadah, the salah, yes. what is the way to zikr? And how do you make that a part of your daily life? Oh, that's such a good question. I just have to give you the credit for it. Um, I get so excited uh, with these questions. Let me build up to the answer. The Quran says, Inna salata tanha anil fahsha wal munkar. Salat prevents you from fahsha, munkar, wrongdoings. Wala dhikrullahi akbar. The remembrance of God is greater. Right? It's such a beautiful sentence because it's often saying that, look, salat is important, but salat in and of itself is a form of dhikr, remembering God. We start with saying, okay, five, five times a day, let's just remember God and then go back to our lives. But that's not the purpose. The purpose is that we can remember God in every single moment of our life. Right? That's the key point. And when you look at What's the definition of Salat? If you look at the Qur'an, if you want to find the, the Qur'anic definition of Salat, it's different to say the narrations talk about Salat, this is what you have to do. If you look at the Qur'an, there's no definition given for Salat. It just uses the word Salat. But there's one verse that maybe you can understand what Salat is by the verse mentioning the opposite of it. Okay? In this verse it says, لا صدق ولا صلى. Talking about a person, he says this person لا صدق ولا صلى. He didn't say the truth, and he didn't pray, didn't do salat. And in the next verse, it says the opposite. بل كذب. So كذب is the opposite of صدق. كذب means he lied. He he went basically. He denied. كذب وتولى. تولى the opposite of صلى. Tawalla means looking away. Salla, based on this definition, you can say that it means looking towards. You can take that and say it's the opposite. Salla, tawalla. You may be able to use this and say salat is something that when you're paying attention to something, okay? The form that it takes place in, when we do it, we do it in, in this, four rak'ah, three rak'ah, two rak'ah. But what's important in Salat is the dhikr and the us facing towards God and being before Allah. So if this is the reality of it, our life should turn into a life that all, of our, of all the aspects of our life is divine, is divinely inspired, is godly, the remembrance of God exists, is facing towards God, is not looking back at God. And then when we come to Salat, that's why our scholars say, they say you don't have attention in your Salat. It's because in the times other than your Salat, you're doing everything other than remembering God. And this switch is very difficult to do. You know, it's not like a button you can switch. Okay, guys, back to Akhirah. And then the moment you switch it off, you go back to dunya. It needs to extend. So this is an explanation on that. I hope that sufficed. None of these things are Irfan, okay? In Irfan in the way people talk about it, right? This is pure teachings, I think, personally, these are pure teachings of the Ahlul Bayt and the Qur'an, okay? Now, there is this notion of, okay, Irfan, and some scholars discuss it, I have no view for or against it. I'm just saying that there's no, because one of the gentlemen here asked me last night, they say, you know, what you're saying, don't you think that the majority disagrees with it? Because this is like Irfan, philosophy, whatever. I said I have did not mention Irfan or philosophy whatsoever. I don't know anything about it, <laughs> if I want to be honest with you. But there's one thing very important is that all these scholars agree with the fact that we are spiritual beings and these are spiritual teachings of Islam. Now when it comes to the details, how to do this, how to embark on this journey, what is the journey and some details, and yeah, they disagree and it's fine. 
But what I have been mentioning, there's um, I can probably claim that there's almost an, a consensus on the majority of them. The fact that tawakkul is necessary, the fact that gratitude is necessary. These are practical things. Now, none of these scholars differ on these. There's some nitty-gritty details of it, which that's not you know, something we bring to the member. No. A couple of questions from the, from the internet. Um, from the, any new books you consider a must-have? I, I, I can't think of any at the moment. Yeah, that's okay. I need to think about it. How to understand meaning of heaven and hell talked in the Quran? Is it metaphor or literal? There's differences of opinion on that. Okay. <laughs> What's for sure is that it's real. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. <It's> <laughs> like there's metaphor. going to be some, you know, accountability. Now, what does that actually mean? It's, it's a long discussion. I, I probably don't know a lot of the discussions there anyway. Right, okay. Um, any other questions from the floor? I think there was a question there you had, Omar. Oh. Yes. Can you please come forward and take the mic? Um, it was regarding the Salah. Uh, w when I became Muslim, like many of the brothers and sisters, we didn't know any Arabic. Yeah. We would have English to translate oration in front yes. of us, or in, you know, and we learned the English. Then over the weeks and months, we learned how to make our tongues use the Arabic, and then it's months of the English molding in the Arabic and then the yeah. Arabic being replaced. And like you said, certain key words like alhamd. When people start to tell us this word alhamd, everything in creation, ev the sun, moon and stars, the galaxies, the cosmos, the ants, the sea, is all in a state of hamd, hamd. of praiseworthiness. And this praiseworthiness can also lead to adoration. Mm. And adoration can lead to to that appreciation, that gratitude for your own existence. We, we, yeah. we was, this is the mentality that we had to uh, uh, take on. And, and when we looked at the word salah, we were thinking prayer. And one of the teachers said, the word salah, it's related in its roots, isla. He said, these words, denote connection, linking, uh, to be joined, to in some ways touching, in this kind of thing. And so when they explain it like this, and adding to what you said, you know, Salah and, and, yeah. and Tawalla, yeah, like you're turning to, and Allah says, wherever you turn your eyes or your face, Allah is there. So even the thing of turning to Allah is a multi-directional thing, you know, it's all, yeah. So, I wanted to say, came back to this thing of connecting in some way. When we started to think and feel like this, and we make our niyyah and say, Qurbatan mm. illallah, we started to feel. It st stopped being about concentration only. Yeah. That was the foundation. And it started to be transformation through feeling. So I think the question that was asked regarding English as the language they know and they're not feeling it so far, I would like to remind them that sabr, that patience, mm. also means endurance. To endure yes. this trial, Allah loves you and Allah is responding to you. Yeah. And as we do our prayer more, our ability to hear grows. And um, I just wanted to add because I think I Thank know who you. sent the question. That's a, no, that's a very good point. Yeah, thank you very much. It's first time thank experience. You. And, you know, many of us may not even have these experiences. I'm very glad that you shared it. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Wonderful story. Thank you, brother, for that. Uh, Ali, just a quick one because I, I want to finish it in a few minutes. Quick one. Yeah. Um, I remember you mentioned that we shouldn't have this pseudo akhlaqi view that when someone compliments us, we shouldn't just in our head think that we don't have that. Yeah. And when that did I say that? Is it, was it here in the lecture? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> you might have been there. <laughs> I have to go back and watch my <laughs> So, but that is something interesting because that is something I thought you're supposed to do in that when someone compliments you about something, to stay humble, you sort of are like, nah, this could have been better. 
things like that, rather than actually accepting that you did well and letting it get to your head. So what is the correct approach when someone compliments you about something? I think it's, it's important for us to be aware of the fact that when someone compliments us, there's a potential of it getting into our head. That's a good one, <laughs> right? It, there is, and I'm not denying that whatsoever. So that needs, that's a struggle every human being needs to deal with. That when someone says, MashaAllah, you know, you've got such a beautiful voice, you're reciting and everything, and it's like, ha, it pumps you up. So you have to be careful with that. Yes, but how do you respond to it? That's my point. Often people, in order to get away from that ego, they, to themselves even, they say that, no, I have nothing, you know, I don't have anything. And that can potentially be very harmful, because then they will completely ignore the success they have in their life. And that's something we see a lot around us, that you look at them depressed, and like, why are you depressed? Like, I have nothing, you know, I've done nothing. I'm like, yeah. But a religious person acting this way, thinking that because for their whole life they've been told that when you achieve something, just completely ignore it because, you know, it's going to get into your head. I'm like, no, that's not the right way of doing it. It's important to acknowledge it can get into your head, okay? But at the same time, it's important to acknowledge that Allah has given you that thing and you have now that potential, you've actualized it and it's out now. So you have to pay its due shukr. And by doing that, you have to acknowledge it. You have to see it. You have to say, yes, alhamdulillah, I, I did that. I did that with the grace of God. Okay? But you have to work on, for it not to get into your head, you have to work on a different concept. And that is seeing everything through tawheed. Seeing that, you know, yeah, I've done this, but the same way I did it, in a split, split of a second, it can be taken away from me. I leave this door, God forbid, a car can hit me. If I'm so smart, I, that's it, I lose my... So, you realize, you have it, but you realize the reality of its temporariness. It's temporary. That, so, it's a reality. It's not fake anymore. You know, I'm not saying, hey, no, you don't have it. You think you have it. No, of course you have it. You, you feel it, you can see it. You know, I have this. But remember the fact that whatever you have can in a split of a second be taken away from you. If I can speak very well now, you think this is something I have, like I have, I'm holding on to? God forbid in a split of a second I can, God forbid the strokes people go through, that's it, I can lose my ability to speak. So was it really mine? It wasn't. It's acknowledging that aspect of it. It takes away that, you know, you're, you know, you're pumped now, it's just, it, it bursts it for you. It's like, okay, alhamdulillah, God, you gave me, you, you gave me the ability, you gave me the opportunity to grow into this, to develop, to actualize this potential you've given inside me. Oh Allah, help me keep it as long as possible. And oh Allah, make me grateful of it. When you're grateful of it to Allah, then you can probably use the verse that says, وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثِ with the ni'mah of your Lord, what? Hide it? No. Speak about it. Share it. You say, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Allah has gifted me with this and I'm sharing it with you. I'm not going to deny. No, Alhamdulillah, it's a gift. It's from God and I'm not holding on to it. You know? SubhanAllah, SubhanAllah. Thank you. We've got a young person here with a question. Please go ahead. I've been taught that if you do something with... Um, that has lots of sawab, mm. and you do it with the intention of getting the sawab, that sawab disappears, then, and you, and you still, you want to do it for sawab, but you can't do it now because there's no more sawab that you get, yeah. then what do you do? That's a deep question. <laughs> You know, at the end of the day, you're doing something for the sake of God, yeah? You say to God, oh Allah, I'm doing this for you. You like goodness to be spread. You like people to do good. So I'm doing it for you. And the thawab is just an outcome, you know? It's, it's a result of it. God says, thank you very much, and he gives you. So it wouldn't go away, 
you know, but you're saying you're doing it for God, and you know that there's going to be thawab too. He encourages you for that, you know. He says, ah, by the way, you do this, I'm going to give you that. It's not going to go away, the thawab. Don't worry about it. Yeah? Excellent. Thank you. Uh, we got one last question now because time is really up. Actually, uh, this was the this was the question which I was actually going to ask you, and fortunately enough, somebody else also have asked the same question. So good, it's <laughs> two in one. Yeah. The question is simple: that we all have benefited a lot from these wonderful inspirational lectures. Now, how do we continue to benefit? Where can we join your future lectures? That was a question, basically. Thank you. Um, Perhaps your some you have some YouTube channel or your Instagram, Instagram where you normally give lectures. So yeah. I don't know who somebody has very same question they've asked, and I was also going to basically yeah. ask the same thing. I think this is perhaps the time. I've been asked by the Hausa that I teach to wherever I'm lecturing to you know mention the name and <laughs> encourage people, and every time I forget. Leaflet. Right? I, I brought the leaflets <laughs> now, alhamdulillah, I put them there. Oh, okay. so, um, so I think it's a good opportunity. I mean, thank you very much for asking that question. I don't see myself worthy of being followed in any way possible. I'm saying this truly because, I mean, whatever it is, alhamdulillah, I'm sharing and I don't have m that much to share. Um, but the, the amount that God has blessed me, alhamdulillah, with, I'm trying to share a bit more on Instagram. So I do have my Instagram page, which is mh underline r-o-u-s-h. So that's my um, Instagram ID, you may call it, mh underline r-o-u-s-h. I'm sharing some content there. And I teach at the Islamic College and the Hausa in London in Northwest Wilsdon Green. The Hausa provi provides um, traditional Hausa studies to students here in the UK. Those who are interested in Islamic studies, they start with learning Arabic, um, conversation Arabic, Arabic grammar, and then they go into the normal topics, theology, fiqh, jurisprudence, principles of jurisprudence, and Quranic sciences, etc. And I'm also one of the teachers there. There are greater scholars, more knowledgeable scholars there as well, and I'm just, just one of them, one of the teachers there. And... Um, Yep, so that's where you can find me, and also Instagram. I don't have YouTube, and I'm not very good with technology. I'm not, I know I'm not that old, but I don't know. I, I, I'm not great with technology, and I don't have the time to make you know, these fancy videos. So if someone really wants to do that, then you can start with these lectures. Maybe if you can make some short videos out of them, then we can put, a, put it on a YouTube video if you think it's necessary. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank All everyone. All that remains. Sorry, go on. No, uh, me, you, just I wanted to thank. It doesn't make any difference. Yeah, so I'd like to thank everyone for, for joining, for attending all these nights. And thank you for listening. And I hope that they were beneficial for everyone. And thank you for your time. Thanks to the organizers. I'd my sincere gratitude towards them. And alhamdulillah for this experience. And I hope I see everyone once again. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much.